Allah's eternal decree. Um, this will take us up to Salatul Asr, um, Asr inshallah. <coughs> We're going to follow the usual format where priority is given to written questions rather than those taken from the floor. So please write your questions down when the brother hands out the pieces of paper. Also please can you keep them on the topic because alhamdulillah we've got a lot of questions but most of them aren't on the topic so we'll have to leave them and answer them when we get the chance. So without any more delay I'll hand it over to the Sheikh again inshallah. <coughs> الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد um, We now come to the, uh, the fourth uh, section in, in, in the creed we're studying and that is regarding Allah's uh, Qadr uh, Now Allah's Qadr is and uh, His decree is from His actions so therefore it's from His attributes and that's why Ibn Qudama says that among Allah's attributes uh, is that He is the performer of what He desires. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Buruj, فَعَالٌ لِمَا يريد. So, I mean, one of our beliefs then, therefore, we should have, because this is an ayah in the Qur'an, we do not reject it, we do not interpret it, we do not liken Allah to His creatures. We say that Allah, you know, does what He wants. Uh, and so therefore Ibn Qudama says nothing comes into existence but by his desire nor does anything escape from his will so whatever Allah wills is and whatever he wills not is not and will never be and this is what Qadr, belief in Qadr is and then so he repeats that same meaning and he says there is nothing in the world that escapes from his measuring nor emanates but under his direction. In other words, the word to emanate means to, to proceed. Uh, that's the same thing as to saying that whatever Allah wills is, and whatever uh, Allah does not will is not. Nor is there anything, uh, nor is there any escape for anything from what has been foremeasured, nor goes beyond what has been penned in the written tablet. Uh, so, what does faith in Qadr mean? Well, faith in Qadr, first of all, we should understand that. Faith in Qadr is one of the six pillars of Iman that the Prophet ﷺ said when asked by Jibreel. Jibreel came in the form of a Bedouin Arab. And that's one of the ways in which uh, the revelation would be communicated. And sometimes the angel would come to the Prophet ﷺ in the form of a human being and the pro- his companions would see that and would talk to the Prophet. But sometimes the angel would come in his angelic form. That occurred twice to the Prophet ﷺ. And he would actually see Jibreel. He saw the Jibreel twice as Jibreel was created. And at other times, Jibreel would come and would envelop the Prophet ﷺ. And that was the, the most difficult uh, form of the, of the wahi for the Prophet ﷺ to receive. Because when the angel would, you know, when the angel's being would, would, would mix with the Prophet ﷺ, <clears throat> they could tell that revelation was coming to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because of the, the, the effects that would occur on his body. His eyes would rise up. He would break out into a sweat, even though it was a very cold day. Uh, he would one time, on his, uh, he was riding on a camel, and the camel couldn't bear his weight and, and came down. Uh, one time his thigh was upon the thigh of Zayd ibn Thabit, and Zayd ibn Thabit thought his thigh was going to explode because of the heavy weight upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So these physical changes would occur to the Prophet Sallallahu So, in the hadith of Jibreel, Jibreel came in the form of a Bedouin Arab to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And immediately, the Prophet Sallallahu who was sitting in the masjid with his companions, immediately the companions felt there was something strange going on. Why? Because it came to them a person who they did not know. He wasn't from an inhabitant of Medina. Okay? And yet, he came with very white clothes and very dark hair and yet there was no, you know, sign that he was a traveler. So, so where did he appear from? I mean, you know, I mean, especially you have to understand that, I mean, Medina, the Prophet's t- town was very small. So, I mean, you knew everybody there in Medina. Uh, uh, so if, if he was a Bedouin, 
it would come from the desert, then the sign of a traveler would appear upon them. They didn't have showers and hotels and rest stops, right? So, I mean, you would, you, when you go in the desert, you know, saying you become dusty, you know, the, 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 the complexion, your complexion changes, the dust appears in your hair, it appears in your beard, it appears on your clothes, yet there was none of those signs. His face was still white, very white. His hair was very black, so there was no dust. His clothes were very white, but he had nobody knew him. So, he sat down and placed his knees against... Uh, point against the Prophet ﷺ's knees and his hands on the Prophet ﷺ's thighs and he said, Oh Muhammad, tell me what is Islam? So what did the Prophet ﷺ respond? Nobody, nobody knows this whole audience? Huh? Yeah, well, what are the five pillars? That's why I want to, I want to hear that. Huh? Alright, to testify that there is none, the Prophet ﷺ said, and Islam is that you testify that what? That there is none worthy of worship but Allah? Huh? And? And Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and and to establish the prayers, right? And to give the zakah, right? Fast month Ramadan. There's there's two narratives. One says Ramadan before zakah, and and to make Hajj if you if you if you have the ability. And then he said, "What is iman?" And what did Jibril respond? I mean, what did the Prophet respond? Huh? That is to believe in Allah, yeah, and then. And the angels, okay? The scriptures, right? The messengers. The last day. And and to believe in Qadr, it's good and it's evil. The brothers in Washington, D.C. are much more interactive, so we have to get you, <coughs> brothers. So. Huh? Reserved English character. Reserved English character. Well, we had to, <coughs> to figure out how to break that in one way. So. <laughs> so, uh, so the point is, is that, um, and, and this is this is the, uh, I mean, as a side point, I mean, this is the sunnah of the Prophet I mean, how did he used to teach knowledge by asking questions and having people respond? Because when you ask a question, it becomes more affirmed in the in the mind of who you ask, and so, you know, that's uh, that's the, from the sunnah of the Prophet I mean, that's why I, I like to. I mean, do it. That's why the Prophet said, Oh, Mu'adh, you know what Allah's right is on his servants and what his servants' right is upon Allah? And, and, and like this, you know, question and answer between Jibreel and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. So the point is, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that part of Iman was to believe in uh, Qadr. And if, if you look at the Hadith in Arabic, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded, he said, Iman is to believe in Allah and to believe in His angels and to believe in His scriptures and to believe in His messengers and to believe in the last day. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, Wa and tu'min. He said, and to believe in Qadr. He repeated the verb. You see, the first time he said, it's and to believe in Allah. He used the verb to believe, the verb Iman. Then he said, and His angels. He just said, and, and, and. When he came to Qadr, he again used the verb and tu'min, and that you believe. So why did the Prophet ﷺ repeat the verb before Qadr, believe in Qadr? Because the, the ulama say that the wisdom behind that is because the Prophet ﷺ knew out of revelation that there will be people from his ummah who would deny Qadr. And so therefore to, to emphasize this, he re- re-emphasized the verb. Otherwise, otherwise in the Arabic language, according to the Arabic grammar, he could have said, and Qadr, <coughs> and the last day, and Qadr. But he said, and to believe in Qadr, okay? So, so faith in Qadr is one of <coughs> the six pillars of <coughs> Iman. And if you disbelieve in Qadr, you disbelieve in Iman, and so therefore you're a, a kafir, an unbeliever. And that's why the, uh, some of the Salaf used to say that, you know, that he who doesn't believe in Qadr, Allah will burn him in the hellfire. Uh, so what is faith in Qadr? Well, faith in Qadr is that you believe in four matters. It, it, it's, faith in Qadr is simple. It's, it is not confusing. If we understand these four matters. The first matter is that we believe in Allah's knowledge. That Allah's knowledge has encompassed everything. And this is, this is really the basis of understanding Qadr. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. And Allah knows everything even before it occurs. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is not like our knowledge. I mean, we didn't know what happened today until it happened. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what happened today, before today was. He knows what will happen tomorrow. He'll know what will happen until the end of the creation. Because He is Allah azza wa jalla. So His knowledge is, is like such. The second aspect of believing in Qadr 
is to believe that Allah has written everything and his writing follows his knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, informs us that everything is in a kitab meaning a scripture in a book and this is the book of decrees and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the first or among the first things which Allah created was the pen so Allah said to the pen write the pen said what should I write Allah said write everything which will occur until the day of judgment so the, Allah commanded the pen to write everything which will occur to the day of judgment because Allah knows what will occur until the day of judgment okay the third matter of Qadr and another hadith in Sahih Muslim it says that Allah decreed or measured the decrees of the creation 50,000 years before he created the heavens and the earth and his throne was above the water so this has happened 50,000 years preceded before Allah created the heavens and the earth the third part of belief in Qadr is that we believe that um, <coughs> is that we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed everything as, as I said that you know nothing that Allah wills uh, uh, nothing exists except if Allah has willed it and if Allah does not will it it does not exist and it will never come to existence this is the third aspect of belief in Qadr so whatever you see in the heavens of the earth is because Allah has willed its existence and has willed that to occur nothing goes against his command nothing goes against his, 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 um, his, his, his order and if it doesn't occur if it hasn't occurred if you haven't seen it that means Allah has not willed its existence and the fourth aspect of belief in Qadr means that Allah has created everything he created us and he created our, our characteristics and he also created our deeds our actions what does it mean that Allah created our actions well whenever you want to do an action any action a voluntary action it proceeds from what from having a will and a choice so who is the one who gave you the will Allah is with you. and who is the one who gave you the ability to do that action Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so that therefore since Allah gave you created for that for you then whatever proceeds from that is also created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. for instance the animals the, do the animals have an ability to choose in what they do no they follow their instincts I mean the, the animals have been basically programmed to act a certain way and they, and they act that way they, they really don't have much choice in how they act you know I mean or, and if they do it's very limited few parameters you know if you study animal behavior uh, now the and, but, and the ability to act the ability to do to, to actions I mean Allah has given it to us so, so therefore all, anything which proceeds from that Allah has created and so this is why he says in the 49th paragraph Ibn Qudama he willed what the world did had he shielded them from sin they would have not opposed him and had he willed that they all obeyed him they would have all obeyed him you see so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we find on earth now there are people who believe and people who disbelieve and among the believers are the pious and there are the wicked okay and there's many degrees in between that so had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted all the people on the earth to obey him and to worship him and not disobey him he would have created us like he created the angels and had he willed that nobody obey him and everybody disbelieve in him and he would, would have then nobody would have obeyed him and nobody would disbelieve him so when a believer does an act of goodness whether it's act of faith or righteous action it's because Allah has willed that and, and has blessed him with that act and when a disbeliever does an act of disbelief or does a, an act of sin it's because Allah has willed it that don't believe that that disbeliever actually is doing something and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot stop him that's the belief of the Christians see the Christians they have this, 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 this mistake the Christians think, if you look in Christian theology, they say, well, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, and Adam sinned. And then you know, the devil fooled Adam, came in the form of the snake, and fooled him, and so on. And then they, they came to, to earth. Okay. Now, so all the, because of that original sin, all the people were going to hell. All right? And so even Moses and Abraham and Noah and so forth was in hell. Okay? But then they say, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, because he loved the world, right? He so loved the world, as it says, right? So he sacrificed his only son. And so, since Jesus had no sin on him, okay, 
So when Jesus was crucified, as they say, even though he was, they neither killed him nor crucified him, so when Iblis came to take his soul, you know, Iblis thought that this was a man, and so he figured that he had a sin on him, so he took his soul, so he put him in, in the prison, meaning in hell, okay? And so he stayed there for three days. But because he had no sin, you see, so therefore Iblis was forced to open the prison door. And so once Iblis opened the prison door, then all the righteous were able to escape prison. And that, 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 that's, that, that's the summary of Christian belief. So in other words, I mean, in other words, Iblis, right, uh, put Moses and put Aaron and put David and put Solomon and put Noah and, and, you know, and all these prophets of Allah, alayhi salam, right, put them in hell and locked the door against them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was unable unable to, to take them out even though they were put there you know what I'm saying I mean wrongly until he had to play this trick on Iblis by putting you know I mean his son Ta'ala and so then when you know after three days you know what I'm saying Iblis was forced to open up so when he opened it up then the, the souls of the saints and the righteous were able to come out I mean that's what if you go to, if you go to Sunday school in a Catholic you know, environment that's what, that's what they teach in part of their creed so so here, it, this, is, this is obviously, you can see here, that the Christians were influenced by what? They were influenced by the beliefs of who? The Magians, right? Majus, right? Who believe that there are two, you know, gods. A god of good and light and a god of evil. And they're, they're in an eternal struggle between the two. But, but the people of Islam, the people of Tawheed, you know, we do not accept that. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has subdued all his creatures. And Iblis himself, the devil himself, had to ask Allah for respite. I mean, when Iblis, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Iblis, you know, what is it that prevented you uh, to uh, prostrate to that who I created with my own hands? And Iblis said, you know, I, you, I am better than him. You created me from fire and you created him from clay, from the earth, okay? And what did Iblis then say? He also, Iblis said, you know, give me respite until the day which you resurrect them. In other words, let me live. Don't punish me now. Let me go. So Iblis himself recognized that he was Allah's servant. In the sense that, not in the sense of Allah's servant, in the sense that he worships Allah, but in the sense that he's subdued and he's under Allah's command and under Allah's control. Because, I mean, had... Had Iblis had the own, his own power, as, as the Christians think, which, because they were influenced by these pagan ideas of the, of the Majus and the Magians and so forth, then Iblis would say, okay, well, I, I am, I'm one type of deity and you're another, and I'm going to fight in some sort of eternal struggle, right? But Iblis is Allah's servant, so Iblis had to ask for respite. So, when, when Ibn Qudama says here, you know, had he shielded them from sin, they would have not opposed him, and had he willed that they all obey him, they would have obeyed him, right? This is, this is the truth of the matter. No one commits a sin except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left him to his own. And that's why, I mean, the importance for the believer, right, to realize that if Allah doesn't shield you from sinfulness, you will sin. I mean, this is, this is a point of spirituality that we should all understand, that, that your soul in its nature will whisper to you to do evil and that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't protect you and shield you from your own self you're going to fall into some sort of evil and that's why it comes in the khutbah al-hajjah I mean who, wh what do we seek refuge in khutbah al-hajjah okay right from the evils of our souls what, what does that mean from the evil promptings of our soul and from the bad consequences of our deed because you see when your soul prompts you to do evil right so you do a deed and so the sayya the deed is the bad consequence of that deed because you did an evil deed and the consequence could be bad in the sense that it could result in a blessing being removed from you could result in punishment coming to you in this world could result in punishment coming to you in the hereafter could result in punishment coming to you in the grave so, so, so you're seeking refuge from, from, from the prompting from what initiates and after you've fallen into it what might result from it I mean, that's, that's, that's the point of that's, that's the point of Dura. why didn't the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seek refuge from Satan in Khutbah Al-Hajjah because the evil of the soul is greater and more harmful than the evil of Satan 
And that's why the Salaf used to spend more time uh, in watching the soul than watching, the, worrying about the whispers of Satan. Of Satan, even though Satan is an enemy to us, as Allah says in the Quran. But but you see, but later on, when spirituality, I mean, got confused, people, you know, people have the tendency to blame Satan, right? Oh, it's shaytan. Oh, it's shaytan. So shaytan, not realizing that the perversity lies in their own soul itself. And, I mean, yes, Shaytan whispers, but I mean, if, if there was, you know, if there, if there wasn't fertile ground there, you know what I'm saying, then the whispering wouldn't have gone where it's gone. So they used to seek refuge uh, from that. And so the point is, is that, I mean, we learn a spiritual lesson from this by, you know, we, I mean, it's the point of Aqidah, had he shielded them from sin, they would have not opposed him, in the sense that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't protect us, we would, we would fall into sin. Yes, brother. Yes, uh, uh, but, but what, what about it? And what, what aspect? I mean, I, I don't know. What's, what's, what's the context that you're asking me? No, I, uh, I mean, I said that. Yes, I mean, I said that the, 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 the danger of the soul is, is, is greater than the danger of Satan. Yes, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, for a great wisdom, puts both of those, you know. Uh, both of those, you know, um, uh, conflicting uh, trends in it, right? Uh, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Al-Shams, right? فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala inspired into the soul, right? It's fujur, what what causes its wickedness, and also what causes its piety. So the, the nature of the soul is such that it 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 has the ability to uh, go in both directions, all right. And this is this is what you know. This is how the test comes. You see, you know, had the soul been um, one thing, but the fitra refers to what? The fitra means that the natural state of a human being is to worship Allah That shirk, right? Uh, worshiping others with Allah is something which is which comes afterwards. You know, as the Prophet Sallallahu said that every child is born upon the fitrah, right? So its parents make it a Jew or a Christian or a fire worshiper. Okay, so in other words, that shirk is not the natural state of human being. The natural inclination of a human being is to worship Allah alone. To worship Allah alone and to obey Allah. But it doesn't mean that, that the, the natural inclination of a human being is, is to be sinless. I mean, there's, a, there's a difference between the two. As, as the Prophet said in another hadith, that all the children of Adams are sinners. And the best amongst them are the repentant. So, um, so sinfulness and the inclination and, 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 and falling into sin is something which is natural for human beings. And that's why another hadith says that um, you know, had you not sinned, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would have come with another creation which sinned and then repented, so He would forgive them. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, in order to manifest his names and, and, and uh, his attributes that he's the one who forgives he's the one who repents and so forth he has created us uh, accepts the repentance of those who repent he has created us in, 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 in this form so I don't know if that's clear uh, so so then he says uh, Ibn Qudama so, so the point is, is that I mean the spiritual lesson which we learn from this is that one should uh, and when worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, I mean one should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve him and to keep him upon the path, right? And that's why the du'a of the Prophet ﷺ, Ya muqallib al qulub, right? Oh, you who, turn, you know, thabbit qalbi al I mean, keep my heart firm upon your religion. Uh, yeah. And um, so, <coughs> now, and so he created the creation and their deeds and for, and for measure their sustenance and their life spans. He created their creation and their deeds. We, we understand the meaning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allahu khalaqul shay that Allah has created everything. Creating their deeds, we explained that in what sense? That you know, when you have a deed, any action, voluntary action from you proceeds from two things, right? Uh, a choice, a will, right? And the second thing is an ability. Who gave you the choice? Allah. Who gave you the ability to act? Allah. So therefore, what proceeds from that is also created. He foremeasured their sustenance and lifespans. This is from the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud that Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said that you know, each one of you is gathered in the belly or in the womb of his mother 
as a lutafa, as a, as a drop for 40 days, and as a halaqa, something clinging for 40 days, and as a mudra, something tuned for 40 days. And then the angel comes and blows the soul into the embryo, and the angel is commanded to write four things. One of, the, one of those matters is your sustenance and how long you're going to live. So all your sustenance was written upon you that, you know, when you were in the, in, in the womb of your mother. And also the length of your life. This is something which was written. Um, now, he guides whomever he wills by his... Uh, it seems that word's missing here. By his will, I guess, or by his intent. or, or No, it was by his... Uh, I think the Aqid said in Arabic, by his, by his mercy. Uh, <coughs> By his wisdom, it's by his wisdom. So he, in, in 51, he guides whoever, who, whomever he wills by his wisdom. As the word was dropped, um, Allah Taala has said, uh, "He shall not be questioned as to what he does, but they shall be questioned." Okay, that that's a good principle for us to understand when it comes regarding to aqidah, and especially regarding Allah's qadr. You know, Allah's qadr is His actions, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You know, tells us in the Quran, لا يسأل عما يفعل that he is not questioned regarding what he does, but he but they will be questioned. So, you know, we it's not for us to question Allah. Oh Allah, why did you, you know, uh, create me this way, or why did you give me only only this much sustenance, or why did you, you know, make so and so who I love die at this age? And, and this is this is Allah's, you know. Prerogative. He, we do not question Allah regarding anything that He does, because we believe that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is the wise, the Hakim, and so whatever Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala does is for a great wisdom, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is the Alim, the All Knowing, and so you know nothing that He does is going to be escapes His knowledge and His wisdom, uh, but He will question us regarding our actions, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says that truly we have created everything in, in measure, in qadr. And um, other ayat which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, which all affirm the principle of Qadr. And then he mentions uh, the hadith of Jibreel uh, by Ibn Umar reporting that Umar said that, you know, the Prophet said that Iman was, which we discussed, to believe in Allah, his angels, his scriptures, his messengers, the last day, and in Allah's decree, the good and evil uh, consequences therefor, um, thereof. Now, um, he then mentions that the Prophet ﷺ said, I believe in Allah's decree, the good and evil consequences thereof, and the sweet and bitter beginnings thereof. So, you know, in Qadr we have two uh, concepts. We, have, we say we believe in Qadr in Arabic. We say khairihi wa sharrihi, right? And we also say huluwihi wa murrihi. So what's the difference between the two? The sweetness and the bitter is when, when the decree comes to you. And the good and the evil is the outcome of, of the decree. I mean, that's the difference. So, you know, you believe in qadr, you know, huluwihi wa murrihi, you know, whether it's sweet or bitter, in sense when something occurs to you. So, <coughs> sometimes something might occur to you, and it's bitter. In other words, it's something which is displeasing, you find it pains you, but its outcome might be good. Its outcome might be good. So, do we believe in qadr, whether... So, when the qadr, when Allah's decree comes to us, it might, it might be good, we might find it enjoyable, so we believe in it, and we might find it you know, distasteful, we still believe in it, and the, the outcome of it could be good or bad, because sometimes something is, appears to us as good, and you enjoy it, but in reality, it, it leads you to a path which is harmful. So you accept it, and you believe in that all. And the Prophet ﷺ taught uh, Al-Hasan bin Ali to say in Qunut, during winter prayer, protect me from the evil consequences of what you have decreed. So we do not claim that Allah's decree and foremeasurement is an arg- as an argument for us in forsaking His commands and committing His prohibitions. Rather, it is required that we believe and know that Allah has established the proof against us uh, by sending to us <coughs> His messengers. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <coughs> Excuse me. لَأَلَّا يُكُونَ لِلنَّاسِ عَلَى اللَّهِ حُجَّةً بَعْدَ الرُّسُلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that 
<coughs> excuse me, that so that humanity would not have an argument against Allah after the Messenger. So, in other words, one cannot use qadr as an argument to say, oh, Allah decreed this for me, so therefore this is why I sinned. I'm, but rather, Allah has established against us the proof by sending to us the messengers. And using a, an argument of qadr in committing a sin, I mean, is the way of the mushrikeen. And it's wrong, and we know this is wrong for a number of matters. We know that it's wrong because, well, first of all, we know that the action is something that you've done, and you've done by your own choice. So, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, you know, uh, given you this ability to choose your actions, and you voluntarily did this action. And it's your action. So, and, and you recognize the difference between when you're compelled to do something and when you do something out of your own choice. Right? So, here, you, you recognize that difference. So then, therefore, you cannot use this uh, example of qadr. Likewise, <coughs> Qadr is something unseen. So, when, when you do an action, you know, in the same way as you did an evil action by your choice, you could have done a good action by your choice. So, to argue by Qadr and say that, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I was, it was decreed upon me to do this evil action, uh, and so I'm not having any responsibility for it. Now, that's, that's a false, because you could have done the good action... And it would have been the same thing. I mean, there was you made the choice. So, you know, what argument is, is, is applicable in, the, in both ways? Uh, at the same time, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't commanded us to do anything which is beyond our ability. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها And that's what uh, Ibn Qudama mentions in the 54th paragraph. That we know that Allah did not command or prohibit except one capable of doing and forsaking. Also, we know that he did not compel anyone upon an act of disobedience or forced him to leave an act of obedience. So, the point is, is that, you know, you're not compelled to do these actions. So, using qadr as an argument is false. But, so somebody might ask about the question of the hadith of Moses and Adam, right? When Moses and Adam had the argument, the debate between the two. And so, Musa, alayhi salam, came to Adam, alayhi salam, and said... You know, why, you, don't you see what state you have put humanity in? You know, why did you, you know, uh, make us expelled of, uh, of, uh, of, of paradise? And, and so then Adam responded, uh, Did you not find in the Torah that it was decreed for me to be expelled out of paradise uh, before I was created? And, uh, and Musa replied in the affirmative. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, So Adam... Adam, uh, you know, um, overpowered or, you know, overcame Musa in the, in the, in the dispute. Now, here, Adam, alayhi salam, was not arguing with Moses, okay, regarding, um, regarding the actual argumentation in the sense that he wasn't arguing with him in the sense that Adam was trying to say, you know, you found this, so therefore it was decreed upon me to, to, to sin. But rather he was saying that the fact that the consequence of my sin that we would be expelled as a, as, as a species, as a creature from, from paradise. This was something which was decreed, that when, when Adam sins, he will, he will be, you know, that humanity will be expelled from paradise. So therefore, you know, the, the consequence of, of one's sin, one can use Qadr as, that, as, that the, as, as, as a truth, because that's the consequence of the sin. But the actual sin itself, you cannot argue by Qadr, because that's your own choice and so forth. And the fact that Allah knows it and He has written it, doesn't mean that Allah has compelled you Onto it, I'm sure in the question and answer we can explore this uh, better. As a, as, a, as a side point, uh, to show you one of the secrets of the Quran, uh, you find um, you know uh, there's a correlation between Adam and Moses and a correlation between Adam and Dawood, and that's why usually most of the surahs where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions Adam, He mentions Moses or He mentions Dawood, and uh, Adam and Musa alayhi salam. The correlation is from this hadith, right? The two of the, the dispute. And likewise, also the correlation in the sense that they're, they, 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 they resembled each other also in terms of their physical characteristics. In terms of Moses was dark like Adam was dark. Uh, Adam and Dawood, uh, the, the correlation between Adam and Dawood, in the sense that the hadith um, you mentioned that um, uh, the hadith where it says that, um, that when, Adam, uh, was, when uh, Adam was created, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought from, forth from his, his loins all the souls of all, the, all his descendants 
and so he saw them and each of them had a light until he saw one of his creatures with a very large light and he said to uh, who is this and he said this is from your uh, from the last of your descendants the name of Dawood and then Adam asked how many years will he have he said 60 so uh, the, the Adam then asked Allah to give him 40 of his own years right so here's a correlation between Adam and Dawood right and also it is said that the repentance of Adam alayhi salam and the sadness that he expressed similarly the, the repentance of Dawood alayhi salam the sadness he expressed were somewhat similar so that's why always in the Quran this is one of the secrets of the Quran uh, you find that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Adam he either mentions Moses in the same surah or he'll mention Dawood that's just a, a beneficial point too. so uh, Ibn Qudama then says that we, in paragraph 54 we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not command or prohibit except one capable of doing or forsaking and we know that he did not compel anyone upon an act of disobedience or forced him uh, to leave an act of obedience Allah ta'ala has said uh, Allah charges no soul save to its capacity and Allah Ta'ala said so fear Allah as far as you're able and Allah Ta'ala has said today each soul shall be recompensed from what it, her- it has earned no uh, injustice will be done today these ayat indicate that the slave possesses both deed and acquires such a deed in other words he does that deed by his own or her choice and that he will be re- recompensed by reward for that which is good of that and be punishment for that which is evil of his deeds. And this occurs by Allah's decree and for measurement. Now we should know that, and I guess one final point I'll make about Qadr is about I mean, understanding when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets people astray or Allah guides people. When Allah sets people astray, we should understand that there's no injustice done to them. But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Saf, uh, concerning the children of Israel فَلَمَّا زَاهُوا when they became perverse أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ Allah made their hearts more perverse so it showed that the perversity was first in them in the Jews and then Allah made them more perverse it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed them that they were upon guidance and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made their, their hearts perverse so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets people astray or seals their hearing or their sight or or their, their, or their hearts or beautifies for them their evil deeds or all these punishments uh, of, of, of the heart and there's about 40 punishments of the heart mentioned in the Quran alone I mean, I mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes the heart in about 40 different ways in the Quran um, so you know uh, we just mentioned five right so this, the sealing of the, uh, the ears the, the, the veiling of the eyes the closing of the heart the making beautiful your deeds the, per- the heart becoming perverse these are just five of forty in the Quran mentioned so the, the point is is that uh, that this comes because of there's an original sickness or perversity like that and that's why the early Muslims used to be afraid of sin because they used to say part of the punishment of doing an act of sin is that it leads you to another sin and that part of the, uh, the reward of doing a good deed is that it leads you to other good deeds because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you or recompenses you with what you did. So if you sin, he gives you another sin. He makes it easy for you. If you um, if you did the act of obedience, he makes it easy for you for act of obedience. So so we you know we turn in Allah's decree back and forth, and so that's why the believer he flees from Allah unto Allah, and he seeks refuge with Allah from Allah, and his journeying is unto Allah in the end. Allah. So that's regarding Qadr we can uh, take any other issues and during questions and answers inshallah Jazakum um, Khair no, uh, no questions as yet from the sister so I'm just going to make a start on the brother's one um, what's the Islamic perspective on evil as um, Allah created everything did he create evil or is evil performed by man? How do we reconcile a child who has cancer, etc.? Please give the answer in terms of dawah to a non-Muslim. Well, <coughs> did Allah create evil? The point is, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to seek refuge from the evil which is in that which he created okay all of Allah's actions are actions of good 
and all of Allah's actions are actions of wisdom however in the object which he's created the created object evil might be there so for example Iblis is evil but in the creation of Iblis there's a good and there's wisdom in Allah's act but the evil is in the created object not in the act of Allah and, and that's what's the important point to understand now so Allah created everything so it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, created everything and, and evil it, it doesn't evil is a non-existing thing is the lack of good. I mean, that's what it is. It's the lack of good. Um, in, in general, that's what evil is. So, when good is not present, is, is the lack of that is is the evil. Um, is evil performed by man? Yes, evil is performed by man, just like good is performed by man. I mean, there's no contradiction in that. How can we reconcile the child who has cancer, etc.? Please give the answer in terms of doubt to a non-Muslim. Well. You know, the, the, the fact that the child has been, you know, struck, or any human being has been struck with a disease like cancer, that is the, the evil consequence of that decree. The decree itself is good, right? So, the, that's the bitterness of the decree. But that decree in itself could be good, because, for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might give a child cancer in order to, as, as a mercy to that child, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have known that had that child grown up who have grown up as an unbeliever, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a child cancer so that in this world the child would die, and so that therefore it would be saved from falling into unbelief as an adult. Or alternatively, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have given the child cancer so that people would be uh, recognized that uh, his, uh, uh, his, uh, his, 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 his power, that he, you know, that he is the one who gives and takes as, as he pleases. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have given a child a cancer because uh, to punish his parents. That they did something, they were unbelievers, they did some sort of sin to punish them. So he took that which they loved from him. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not punish that child. I mean, and that child will be recompensed, you know, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, decrees and causes and, and results in some harm occurring to, to a creature, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then give that creature something which is, you know, better, you know, and, and instead. So these are, I mean, all the possibilities. So that even though it, it might appear, I mean, from one set, from one side of the issue, to be evil, it doesn't necessarily mean that in the, its end, in its conclusion, that it's evil, <coughs> and so forth. So, I mean, in terms of arguing with the, un, in terms of giving dawah to the non-Muslim, <coughs> the point is, is that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is good, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is wise, and nothing that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does except it's for wisdom and it's a good whether we recognize that or not that's a different matter and as the point is is that we do not question Allah regarding what he does but Allah will question us regarding what we do so you know if we understand you know the uh, the meaning of it then alhamdulillah if we understand the wisdom of it if we do not understand the wisdom of it then alhamdulillah we know that there must be a wisdom and there is some good in that and so we accept it because our Lord is good and our Lord is wise and our Lord is merciful and our Lord loves His creatures, and He's gentle with them. And this is His, his nature of our Lord, Azza wa Jal. Uh, and, and as the Prophet Sallallahu taught his companion, I believe it was uh, Mu'adha bin Jabal, when his child died, the Prophet Sallallahu sent him a message and said, you know, belonging unto Allah is what He gives, and belonging unto Allah is what He takes. So in the end, we're His creatures, and He takes from us and gives to us as He wills. And, you know, and so I hope that clarifies can color be changed if we may dua to Allah? Well, there's, there's a hadith which says that nothing repels qadr except for dua. And you have to understand it, understand it in this aspect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a decree which he has written in the preserved tablet. That is, does not change. The pens have written and the ink has dried. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of manifesting his decree he might not manifest it to his creation uh, 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 at one time so there is the decree of Allah is of, of four or five types there is there's the eternal decree which he writ wrote in the preserved tablet as the hadith says 50,000 years before he created the heavens and the earth Allah told the pen to write the pen wrote everything which would occur before the day of judgment then there is a life decree which occurs 
when you are uh, uh, born, or you know, when you're born, before you're born, when you're in the fetus, right, and the angel comes and writes those four statements, whether you'll be happy or sad in the hereafter, meaning in heaven or hell, how long you'll live, what is your sustenance, and whether you'll be male or female. Then there comes a third decree, which is the yearly decree, on Laylat al-Qadr. Okay? That all the decrees for that year will occur. And then there's a daily decree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a decree. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decree something and to show, you know, His creatures and to show His knowledge and to show His, His, His praise and to show His wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decree and say to the angels that if my servant prays this dua, as he enters into his automobile, right? Then, prevent the accident from occurring. But if he does not, then let the accident continue. Now, the angels don't know what will occur. And the people who ride in the car do not know what will occur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what will occur and has written it in the, in the preserved tablet that, that the, this servant will make the dua, so therefore that it will not, uh, not occur. So, so, then, so then Allah's qadr becomes manifest the, the servant makes a dua as he re- enters into the car and so the angels you know what I'm saying they, they act upon the command of Allah Azza wa Jalla, and so they stop the accident from occurring and so this is the meaning of the, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that nothing turns back qadr except for dua and likewise the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that nothing increases in one's age except for Righteousness to one's parents. I mean, if you, I mean, you know, no, nothing will make your life longer except being righteous to your parents. Uh, in the same meaning, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows, you, you know, your life and has written in the preserved tablet how many years you'll live. Seventy years, fifty years, ten years, whatever. But Allah will tell the angels that, you know, what I'm saying that if he is righteous to his parents, you know, if he did something like that, then increase his life by one day today because he. He, he visited his parents or he did some sort of kindness to them so the angels will do that and then, then, it will, then in the end it will manifest as it was written in the preserved tablet which only Allah looks at and only Allah knows what's there now the angels don't know what's in the preserved tablet you see. and they're told like it. so that, that's the, the meaning of the hadith <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the, this is an explanation of the hadith the ayah in Surah Ra'ad where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he affirms what he wants and he abrogates what he wants. وَعِنْدَهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ And with him is the, 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 the source, the, 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 meaning the, the preserved tablet. Okay? So, you know, يَثْبِتُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ You know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he affirms of his decree is what he wants, and he, and he, and he abrogates, he, he removes of his decree is what he wants, and with him is the, the original preserved tablet. So you look at Surah Ra'ad and those hadith, and that's the explanation. Do we share some part of the sin which Adam did? If not, then why do we share in the punishment of being in this dunya and suffering? This is a good question. <coughs> we do not share in the sin in the sense that we will be asked regarding Adam eating from the tree. Because we didn't eat from the tree. But the consequences of, of Adam's sin has extended to his, to, his, to his descendants. And so sometimes a person does a sin, and it says in one hadith, and the effects of that sin you know, is seen for seven generations. And sometimes a person does a good deed, and the effects of that good deed is seen for seven generations. It is said that in the books of Tafsir, uh, regarding Allah's statement, uh, uh, regarding that, um, you know, in uh, Surah Al-Kahf, when um, Musa and Al-Khadr uh, came to a, 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 a wall and uh, it was going to fall and he straightened it up, right? And, and, he, and, and the wisdom behind it, because underneath was a, a treasure which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted not to be discovered until those orphans had become adults, right? It is said in the books of Tafsir that this treasure wasn't from their parents, but it was from their forefathers seven generations before that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted that preserve it just to come because of some good deed that was done way back then to seven generations later for them to, to return that. So the point is is that that we do not share in the sin of Adam in the sense that but the consequences of that sin is felt by us. That's why we're here on the earth. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to be here on the earth. Allah did not create us uh, 
to be uh, in paradise and not here on earth, but rather he created us for that and his wisdom so that we would show that thing, you know what I'm saying? And that's why, I mean, look at, look at the, the eye in Surah Al-Baqarah. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say to the angels, right? Uh, I am placing on the earth, there's a great wisdom, because had Allah not created us in this way, see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Hamid. And Al-Hamid means the one who is deserving of all praise to the extent because of his perfection that he praises himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are certain names and attributes of Allah which are not manifested, you know, unless Allah created a creation like we are, okay? For instance, like the, uh, Allah's name of being Al Ghafur, the All Forgiving. You know, this name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not manifested to the creation, you know, unless there are sinners. If we were all angels, then, then, then Allah's name, Al Ghafur, would not be manifested to the creation. That Allah's at Tawab, that He accepts the repentance. And, you know, because Tawab doesn't mean, I mean, we say, we can say repentance in English, but to, you know, to Taba means to turn. Uh, Taba means to turn. And so, therefore, you know, that, that, you know, when we turn to Allah, Allah turns back to us after we've, we've deviated. You know, had we not, you know, had sin, then we would have not been able to manifest that. Uh, acts of worship which Allah loves of us like to, to command good and forbid evil to wage jihad and to die to, 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 to struggle against one's own desires to call the creation to Allah none of these acts of worship which Allah loves and, and wants us to manifest would have manifested had there not been an evil so there is a great wisdom uh, in that so I, I hope that clarified some aspects of the question can you give some examples of the evil of our souls how are they different from the whispers of the shaitan? Well, I mean, I, I don't... I mean, every... You know, the Salaf used to say that for every being, he, he has a door into, in his soul um, by which, you know, evil occurs. So everyone should be a guard at that door. So, you know, the fitness of one, of one human being... What, what, what leads one human being to go astray is different than what leads another human being to go astray. But in general, I mean, sins are of different types. I mean, there's the, what are known as the, um, the, the huh, excuse me, somebody say that? No, that's fine. Somebody said that there, there's, there's, generally you have the sins which are known as, you know, the sins of, like, the animal sins. And those are like the sins of lust and greed and, and so forth. And then you have, for instance, the, uh, the satanic sins, and that's like, uh, like, um, uh, like you know, and, and mech, I mean, you know, uh, being deceitful and and plotting and uh, and 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 being uh, envious and so forth, right? And then you have the sins which are, you know, which when you try to resemble the divine, you know, what I'm saying by praising yourself and being arrogant and you know and so forth. So there are different types of sins. There are different categories of sin, and so depending upon the soul. And depending upon the nature of that soul, uh, the soul might have one path or the others. But usually people graduate from, from class to class. I mean, usually people start with the animal sins, the sins of lust and greed and so forth. And then they go to the next level of sinfulness, the sinfulness of, of where they, they become jealous and envious. They plot because they're trying to fulfill their lust and their, and their, and their greed. And then they, they graduate from that to the more evil things where they call to their self worship and they become arrogant and so forth. So. Yes. Well, I mean, the, the, the point of the verse asking about the uh, Christians and the, the verse in sort of Falak and we don't say, we don't attribute evil to a lot of respect. Hey? 
I mean, what about the Christians saying that, that Satan is the, the source of evil? That's, that goes back to their belief. You see what I'm saying? I mean, the, the Christians, I mean, even though the, even though Isa and Maryam came with the message of Tawheed, right? They were influenced by the, you know, the other religions and so forth. And so they, they adopted, you know, ideas from the, from the pagans. And one of them is the notion of these two gods, you know what I'm saying? So they have you know, the god of, you know what I'm saying, uh, who, of good and also the, the god of evil. And since that Satan, they give him qualities and strengths and powers, you know, and so forth. So that, that's one thing. And the reason why the Christians were like this, I mean, it's good to know because we live in a Christian uh, uh, society. It's good to know why. It's because, you see, the Christian religion, I mean, the, the da'wah of Isa and was a persecuted da'wah. I mean, Isa and Maryam was, you know, just a few followers he had in, in Palestine. You know, they, and they say that his total followers were seven. You know, his disciples were twelve. And, and he was, you know, chased from village to village by the Jews and by the Romans, okay? And they plotted to kill him and crucify him, even though they did not kill him and crucify him. Allah raised him, but they crucified somebody or they killed somebody who's, who, who's in his resemblance. And then his, his, his followers were persecuted. They were persecuted by the Jews and they were persecuted by the pagan Romans. And I mean, if you read early, you know, early history, uh, what they call the history of the church, or the, or the early history of the, of the Nasrat or the Christians, you know, you, I mean, they went under persecution after persecution after persecution. A religion like this, when it's a religion which people used to hide their beliefs and there was not openly preaching and there were no people to teach them and they lost their scripture, right, is going to pick up the ideas around them. It's not going to be clear. So they, so they between themselves, they deviated and so forth. And they had different sects. I mean, in their early history. And, and, and each sect considered the other to be unbelievers and so forth. It, it only became established when Christianity became established 300 years after Isa and Maryam, when Constantine accepted uh, you know, the, the church doctrine, he became a Christian, he had the council in 325, which is halfway between Isa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a wisdom that, because between Isa and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa how many years? 600. And halfway, halfway between that, the, the bid'ah, the changed religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes established. You see? And then the remaining 300 years and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So, that's why the Christians are like that. As far as the ayah, uh, you know, that min sharri ma khalaq, right? Okay, here, the word khalaq here doesn't refer to the verb meaning what Allah created, meaning his action. But it refers to the object which is um, what is created the evil that is in a creation okay so I, I don't know how they translate it but because sometimes the masr in the Arabic language you know sometimes it can refer back to the verb or sometimes it can refer to the object and over here it refers to the object yes it is part of the third question was that it is part of respecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that as the Prophet sallallahu taught us you know, that we say in the dua wa sharru laysa ilayk that evil is not attributed to you so we do not attribute evil to Allah, neither in His decree, neither in His action, neither in anything. And the evil is in what is created in the, the object, and that evil is a non-existing factor. The evil is what? The lack of good. It's just like somebody said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, did he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not say that He created us, you know, that He created insan fi ahsani taqweem, in the best of form, Right? But some, creature, some human beings are born deformed, right? So, whenever Allah creates something, it comes out perfect. So, how do we understand that there is something which is, I mean, an imperfection coming when Allah creates a, you know, uh, some sort of deformity? Is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put his act of creation in that thing. And so, when Allah removes his act of the creation from something, it then deforms. No, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it in its essence, I mean, but, but the point is, is that Allah didn't, didn't put his full creation for that thing. You see, you see what I'm saying? I mean, you know, that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah shaped it, he didn't shape it, so, so it, it, on it, he left it to itself, and so it deformed. But I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gave, if you meant who created this, who brought it from non-existence, it is Allah, I switch up. So I don't know that answer is that. So. <coughs> yes, brother. That's a tough question, the brother's part. Uh, which one's that? Because I've rearranged. Oh, so they've been shuffled. This one. Okay. Um, 
what makes one soul more evil or more, more good than another? Is it just the way Allah made that soul or is it the, a result of its upbringing or a combination of both? Well, it's a combination of both. All right. I mean, and so, I mean, you know, the upbringing, the environment also is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses, I mean, a soul and so forth. So, I mean, I mean, obviously there's a difference in, in, in the souls of human beings. But the point is, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. So, he, he would never punish a soul if it didn't choose that evil path. But without doubt, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses and, you know, his, Allah's blessing, I mean, this is the difference. Allah's blessing is just by His, by his merit. He gives it to whom He pleases. But his, his, his punishment is by His justice. He gives it to who only deserves it. But His blessing is, is His, you know, it's his, 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 his good that comes is, is His blessing. He gives it to who He pleases. And that's why, you know, I mean, that's why when Allah blesses you with something, I mean, you should be really, I mean, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us and made us Muslims, I mean, this is something which. And we cannot thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Yeah. Um, some often find the issue of qadr hard to comprehend. How do you relate the concept to someone that asks, if Allah knows your nature and the deeds you are to commit, why would he create people just to put them in the hellfire? That means they have no choice. No, I mean, the last part of the question that they would have no choice is, is, is not that's a, that's a wrong assumption because Allah knows a person is going to do evil it doesn't mean Allah compelled him to do evil you see what I'm saying I mean, to give an example if I was to tie you up and, 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 and forbid you from eating and drinking right and then to release you I mean I, I might know with pretty good certainty that the first thing you're going to do maybe isn't to eat or drink but that compels you I mean you could just, you know, if you felt there was poison in that food, you might just, for, you know, hold yourself from eating and drinking, right? So, and, that, and that's a poor analogy, but that's about the best I, I can do. So, the, the point is, is that, um, that just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that a person is going to act a certain way, doesn't mean that he compels him to act that way. But just Allah knows that the person is going to choose these actions, and so he, and he announced it. Uh, and, he, and he wrote it in, in, in the preserved tablet. Now, uh, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this? It's because this is, this is the, this is, this is shows the wisdom of Allah is which are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, you know, a creature which can, which has amongst its prophets and messengers and people of piety. It has amongst its people like Pharaoh and Abu Lahab. And so he is the all praiseworthy. And that is why the people will enter into the hellfire praising Allah, Azawajal. I mean, if you look at Surah Zumar, the 39th Surah of the Quran, I mean, that, the last few verses of Surah Zumar, I mean, shows you how the Day of Judgment will be. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions that, you know, what I'm saying how 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 the how the how the prophets will be brought and how the balances will be set up, and how the people will be taken to the hellfire in. Uh, in groups, and how the people will be dragged to the and people will be led into paradise in groups. And then, what does the ayah say? وَقِيلَ الْحَمْدُ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ means, after all this judgment has occurred, it is said by everyone there, the angels and the people in paradise and the people in hell, الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ because it shows His justice and His mercy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to manifest this so that the people would praise him and say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen so the people will go into the hellfire praising Allah just like the people will go into paradise praising Allah no well, it's for, for, for both groups of course that's why they're praising Allah because, because Allah's justice and mercy has manifested I mean to such a degree Yes, all, all the creatures. And the shayapan. And the shayapan. Right. Uh, why, why? Right, I mean, I mean, that's right, because, because Allah is a merciful Lord, and they know Allah is merciful, so they, they ask Malik, you know what I'm saying, to, 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 to reduce the, the punishment upon us for one day. They ask Malik to 
to, that Malik asks Allah Azza to, to let them die. They ask Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let them return back to the dunya so they can do righteous deed because they know Allah is merciful. And so even though while they're being punished in hell, they're still hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy would reach them. Right. Right. This is this is this, this, right. I mean, I mean, how do we understand this hadith that the Prophet said that a person would do good deeds until between him and paradise is a hand span, and then the kitab would, would would overtake him, and that he would do the, the evil deeds until between him and the hellfire is a hand span, and then the book will overtake him. I mean, this shows us that it's not the apparent nature that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows how the how our nature is, and so to manifest that. To manifest his knowledge, right? It, it appears to, to, to us, it appears to human beings, it appears to the angels, it appears to the jinns, that this man is heading to paradise. Until between him and paradise is a hand span, and then what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew about his true nature appears. And so he dies on a death which leads him to the hellfire. Just like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, the angels, you know, the angels asked Allah, why is it that you're going to create a creature on this earth, right? Yes, who could dima, who will cause facade, you know, uh, corruption in the earth, and will also uh, cause bloodshed, right? What, what did, what did, uh, and we, you know, praise uh, you and glorify you, okay? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Inni? When I know what you know not. Okay, there's two tafsirs for this ayah. Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know what you know not. That I know that amongst your ranks is Iblis. Who even though is praising me and obeying me uh, outwardly, he's going to disobey me. Because Iblis was among the company of the angels. And the second tafsir, I know what you do not know. That in the sense that I know that from this creation is not all will be bloodshed and, and causing corruption but amongst them there will be prophets and, and messengers and righteous men and righteous women so this is to, this is, you know, this is to show the manifest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's you know, knowledge and wisdom and, and ability and what was the second question that you asked uh, there was this one you wanted to your own oh your own personal yeah, and that's why the salaf used to, that's why the salaf used to fear the most thing they used to fear is the death the time of death. I mean, this is this is really where the person, I- his true nature, is going to come out. You know, and, and that's why you read in the stories in the books. I mean, books dealing with the matters of the heart and so forth. How they say the stories about how people who you know who on their deathbed would be, you know, I mean, you know, they would come to them and say La ilaha Allah, and they would say stuff like, you know, I'm saying seven, eight, nine, ten, because you know his heart was only concerned with how much money he was making. Or he, he would be saying, you know, singing a tune, you know what I'm saying, would be re- repeating the words of some sort of song. This is what's called, you know, sekaratun mot, I mean, the, the, the stupor of death. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're, you're in, a, in that type of, you know, it's not like in the world where, you're like, now even the hypocrite, you can say, oh, la ilaha Allah, but here, you know, the true nature is going to appear. Or he'll be saying, you know, the name of, of his lover or, or something like that. But the believer will be saying La ilaha Allah. And that's why the Prophet said, whoever's last words is La ilaha Allah, Dakhal al Jannah, he will enter into paradise. So this is, I mean, this, is, this is the test. And that's why, what did the Prophet say in the dua? Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you that Satan, huh? Yetakh, you know, end al mot. That, you know, that Satan, you know, confuses me at the time of death. And this is a dua of the Prophet said, that he used to seek refuge with Allah that Satan confuses you know, him at the time of death I mean obviously the Prophet ﷺ did this to teach us right because I mean, the Prophet being the messenger of Allah is protected from Allah and so that Satan would be able to you know, overpower him I mean in this world it, 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 the hadith says that, that he, the devil which was with him was submitted or was rendered you know, I mean, uh, imp- uh, you know, overpowered I mean, depending upon how the hadith is read so I mean obviously how could Satan overcome the Prophet sometimes but it's to teach us but we should seek refuge with Allah that at the time of our death, Satan doesn't overcome, doesn't confuse us. So we die upon a religion other than that of Islam. This is the fitna. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, 
So, yes, brother. No, you, we, no, I mean, Allah mentioned many verses concerning Qadr, and, and also Allah mentioned many ver- hadith, Prophet mentioned many hadith concerning Qadr. We should understand them. I mean, people, it decreases their iman and it confuses them when they don't understand these principles. You see what I'm saying? But, and, but if you find yourself in that state, then don't delve into the matter. I mean, if you find the issue confusing, just say, I believe what Allah has said, and I believe what the Muhammad Wasallam has said, and, and continue on, you know. And, and act and, and, and be concerned with that which you understand. You know what I'm saying? But we, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't. This is, I mean, if there was no benefit for us to know this, Allah would have not mentioned it to us. But because it's, there's a benefit for us to know this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this to us over and over in the Quran and also the Prophet them over and over in the Hadith and Sunnah. Yes, uh, sorry, um, because we're bang on time for Asad now, that has to be the last question. So could we all head towards the Musalla please because we've got about one minute um, before you go though the next lecture is outside the scope of the course and it's at 6.45 and it's title is the Ummah and Allah's Promise and before that between 5.45 and 6.30 there's dinner Jazakumullah khair